because there's a powerful move of God at our fingertips. You're hearing rumors and whispers here and there across our fellowship of what God is doing. And you need to believe God that that is your portion in whatever nation or city you're in. I want to have an incredible week. Thank you, Pastor, for the invitation. Thank you, this uh, church in PJ. We thank God for you. You have your Bible tonight, John 11. Uh, Recently, a few weeks ago, I went to visit my cousin. Uh, He's uh, 83 years old. He and I are the last of a whole set of my family generation. Uh, He was very sick. He was in Illinois where I was born. He was so sick he refused to eat. He had lost around around 50 or 60 pounds. The doctor said there's nothing more we can do for him. He couldn't speak. When I went to see him he didn't recognize me. Somewhere, sometime, there will be someone sick in your house. It may be physically sick, it may be sin sick. Your marriage may be sick. Your ministry, your soul may be sick. But it doesn't matter, at that moment you need resurrection power. I want to minister this evening. Is someone sick in your house? Very familiar text, John 11, verse 1 through 3, and then verse 25. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil, wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick, Therefore the sisters sent to him, sent to Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Father, we come tonight by your blood and spirit. By the revelation of your word, we thank you for the reports, the testimony, your presence in your house tonight. God, I'm asking that you bind up the brokenhearted, give revelation to your people, set at liberty those that are bruised, open prison doors to those who find themselves incarcerated. God, we thank you for all you're doing in Asia In Jesus' name, amen. There's possibly no pain like pain in your house. This is a story about a family in crisis. Sometimes it's unavoidable. It's inescapable. Here is a family in crisis. This is true of every home. Some crises are greater than others. We understand that. Some crises have a greater magnitude. Some crises affect the whole house. There's these crises that challenge your faith. They test your commitment. They test your heart and your faithfulness to God. There's a lot of difference between knowing Jesus, quoting some verses or telling some stories about Jesus, even believing in Jesus, than living for him in crisis. A crisis now has crashed into your house. It's not down the street, it's living at your address. It's not praying for someone at church, now it's praying for you. Does your faith see Him when it's your personal pain? 
It's a struggle and an agony in your house. It's not your neighbor again. It's not the church. It's personal pain. I have a sick man in my house. You know, we pray with so much more passion. We pray with so much more intensity when the problem's personal. Now it's not just a social problem. It's not just Russia or Ukraine. We have churches there. Yes, we're concerned. But that's not the same when it's your child, it's your wife, it's your husband, it's your family. When this happens, you're laying on the floor in the middle of the night crying out to God. And there's no escaping crisis in your house. When you come home, it's there. When you get up in the morning and your feet hit the floor, the pain is there. It's your baby, it's your wife. It's someone close to you in the church, in the house of God. What do you do when trouble knocks at your door? Perhaps this gets your attention like nothing else in all of life. This is far different than trouble, economic issues in a nation. It's your brother. It's your father. It's your mother. The Bible says, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus. Many of you know our story, our daughter Gail, many, many, many years ago. I was in the Philippines preaching. Sunday afternoon, Pastor Mitchell had contacted no cell phones in those days, no internet. He contacted the missionary in Metro Manila, rented a small plane. I was on a back island, flew out, and I'm there staying in a Filipino home doing a crusade. And he steps into my room, wakes me up, He said, Joe, I don't know how to tell you this, but Gail is gone. I said, what do you mean gone? He said, there's been a horrible accident. She's deceased. I couldn't call home. Took me almost three days to get home. I can remember this even tonight. The agony. The pain. The questions the torment where do you go when there's trouble in your house that's the question who do you turn to how do you respond how do you process this how do you work through the pain someone's sick they live in your house It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. It doesn't matter how poor you are. It doesn't matter your position in life. You may be famous. Your name can be in the paper every week. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are. Somewhere pain will come to your house. This family loved the Lord. Verse 5 of John 11. Now Jesus loved Martha. And her sister and Lazarus, he had been in their home. He had fellowship with them many times. Trouble is not prejudiced. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor. We heard the report this evening, his precious son. It doesn't matter if you fast three times every week. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. Somewhere trouble and pain will find you. It'll find your house. And it gets your attention. Again, like possibly nothing else. I'll make a statement to you. You've heard me preach this over the year. No pain, no promotion. Pain precedes spiritual promotion 
if you process it correctly. It's interesting, when I went to visit my cousin, as I said, he was really, really sick. He passed away a few days after I left. But the whole house was affected. I remember his wife said to me, Joe, I'm exhausted. I can't leave him for a minute. He's so, so sick. I could feel the depression in the home. The house was dark. I could feel the weariness. His son was there. I could feel hopelessness and desperation in his voice. The whole family, everyone in the house was affected. The doctor said he could go at any time. Who do you turn to? How do you conduct yourself? Tells me who you really are when there's pain in your house, when trouble comes knocking at your door. It magnifies your heart, who you really are. Not who you say you are. Not sometimes who you pretend to be. But who you really are. Who do you turn to? As a Christian. As a man, a woman. Now it's not just religion. It's reality. Question I ask you, have you ever had someone sin sick in your house? Lazarus was sick, verse 14, Lazarus was dead. Sin sick people in our house, they begin to act weird. They begin to do funny things, they become strange to us. They begin to deceive and make excuses. I've had sin-sick people in the house of God. I've had sin-sick people in ministry on the platform. Now they begin to complain about what they once loved. Now they begin to be cynical and critical of everyone in the church. They used to love to give. And now they start complaining They start dressing like a sinner. I preached a sermon recently, ladies. If it's not for sale, don't advertise it. (laughs) Cover it up. Praise the Lord. Amen. Spare us. (laughs) Old attitudes begin to resurrect. Bitterness now moves back to the front stage. Your anger begins to resurrect. Old language that Jesus delivered you from because you're sick comes back in your mouth. Old sins begin to creep back in. You ever had a husband, a wife, a child, teenager, brother, sister? They're sin sick and they're in your house. They don't come home at night like they used to. Bible says the wages of sin is death. Sin will make you sick. Now they begin to say things and they begin to spiritually throw up on you. I've had people become sin sick with rebellion. And disobedience in the house of God. They're there but they're sick. They begin to lie to you. Where were you? Oh I was out. Out where? Oh somewhere. With who? Oh just with some of the guys. What guys? See truth has detail. They're sin sick in your house. And now they're getting all crazy. 
They used to talk and love to speak about the things of God. But no more. Now everything's cynical, negative. They used to love church. Used to love to pray. Used to love to be in the ministry. But now they've distanced themselves. It's interesting. This problem of sickness... This demonic assault waited until Jesus was absent. He's not in the house now. He's not there. The demonic will wait even in the house of God. He'll wait for those moments of isolation where you're spiritually down. You're struggling, pastor, it's not working. You're not seeing fruitfulness. Or someone that you had your hopes and dreams in. You could see destiny. They walk out the door like they never knew you. The fire's gone out of your soul. The passion for God is under assault. Jesus is not there like he used to be. John eleven twenty one. 21, now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. If you had just, I see people right here begin to question God. Does Jesus, his presence and power live at your house? This is true of your home. This is true of the house of God. Is he welcome? Is he comfortable staying at your house? The music you blast, would he listen to it? What you watch, would he be present? Your conversations, would he be there participating? Does Jesus live at your house? So many problems would be solved and resisted if we would just invite him in our house. Praise and worship as God inhabits the praises of his people. I go to churches and preach a lot. Sometimes larger churches, I'm shocked when I go in the prayer room. Before service, there's nobody there. And I wonder what's happening behind the scenes in the hearts and lives of these people. Is his presence in your house? People ask me, especially the last few years since Pastor Mitchell's gone, Pastor Campbell, how have you survived all these years? I'm 81 years old. When I'm preaching, I feel like I'm 28. So I may preach till midnight. Just so I can stay young. Well, I've tried to keep my heart right with God. I've prayed for years. God, I prayed before I came here. God, make me a blessing to this Asian rally. I've repented when sin would try to creep in. Bad attitudes. I've tried to maintain my passion for God. I want His presence. I don't want to just be a shell standing here in flesh behind a pulpit. Does He live at your house? Listen to me, mom, dad, your kids love for you to pray for them, especially when they're small. Take a few moments every evening, lay your hand on them, talk to them about the things of God. It's interesting in the story here in Lazarus' house, right here in the text, the story stops and gives Mary's background It gives an account of her history with Jesus. This is important. John 11, 2. It was that Mary 
who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil. It was that Mary who wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. It was that Mary, the one who brought that expensive gift that vessel of oil that represented money and security, weeping, washing his feet, wiping his feet with her hair. Oh, it was that one, that one that loved Jesus so much, she makes all the lukewarm Christians feel uncomfortable. Is she sitting beside you tonight? Does she live in your shoes? Oh, it's that one. She never missed church. That one who was on outreach even when she didn't feel well. That one who was a single mother, worked a job and raised those kids, yet still ready to serve in nursery. You know that, Mary. That one that makes... Everyone who has an excuse feel terrible when they miss church. Oh, it was that Mary, the one that rebukes all the stingy, covetous folks when it comes to offering time. It was her. Is that you this evening? It's interesting, your testimony is highlighted when someone's sick in your house. But again, my point, no matter how much you serve God, how much you love the Lord, how much the Lord loves you, you can still have a problem at home. Is that you? I'm amazed sometimes there's someone sick in your house. It can be a Lazarus or a Lucy. Or there's someone sick in the house of God and you hide their sickness. You excuse their sin. You defend their sin. Oh, they're not that bad. Or we are sick ourselves this evening. And we try to cover it. Oh, it's, it's, just, it's, not, it's not a real issue. It's not serious. You, say, you don't love me. You don't understand me. No, I do understand you. And I do love you. You're sick. Sometimes it can come crashing. Had a woman in our church some time ago. She said, Pastor, can I talk to you after the service? And I said, of course you can. She's in ministry. Works with young children. After the service, she came up. She was raised in our church. Married a man who was raised in our church, and he backslid. She come and talked to me. She's weeping, tears running down her face. She said, Pastor, and she named her husband. Said he came home from work, and he said, I don't love you anymore. I'm moving out of the house. I'm moving in with a co-worker. And he packed his bags and he walked. She has two children. What do you do right there? What do you do? Listen to me, Pastor. If you don't deal with sin, sickness in the house of God, it'll affect other people. If you're not careful, they will spread their sickness. Proverbs 28, 13, He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes his sin will find God's mercy. These rallies, conferences are designed that we can come and get in God's presence for back-to-back -back services. And if we've been infected spiritually, our faith isn't what it used to be. Our passion, oh, we're still functioning, but it's not the same. 
There's been an infection. There's been a contamination. There's been some sickness. These rallies are designed that we can come and God with His Word and Spirit, relationships, God puts spotlight on it. Says, I want you to deal with it. I want you to address it. I want it to be healed tonight. I want you to be delivered. I want you to be set free tonight. You know, your mind can be sick. A lot of counseling. I preach in a lot of places, the grace of God. Pastors come to me, pastors' wives, people in congregations come to me. I was just in Nogales Conference in Mexico and I preached a sermon. I may preach it here, I'm not sure. From broken to beautiful. And I give a call for pastors' wives. Probably over a hundred of them came weeping. Pain and agony. Things people had said about their children and about them. People they loved and and it affected them. Some of them told me later, Pastor, I was ready to quit. My faith had been shaken. It was sick. Is that you this evening? Can God visit you with resurrection power tonight? Will you expose it? Will you uncover it to God? Not defending it, not blaming someone else. Mary knew who to sin for when Lazarus was sick. The question is, do you? Some of you here tonight, your marriage is sick. Other here, your life is sick. Your mind, your emotions, they sent for Jesus. Your ministry is not as vibrant as it used to be. There's illness in your house. Oh, I thank God for you. I appreciate your prayers, but I've got to get to Jesus. Oh, I know you're talking about rugby. I know you're talking about soccer. I know you want to talk about cricket, but I've got to get to Jesus. I've got to get in that prayer room. I've got to touch him. I need his presence. Listen, that's what's happening here. Oh, Jesus, we've got to send for Jesus. If Jesus would just be here, you don't have a sin or a sickness that he can't heal if you'll call on him. As I mentioned when I was visiting my family, when I got ready to leave, my cousin's wife and son said, Joe, please pray, pray, pray for us. Pray for us. And I did. Who do you sin for? Who do you turn to? Listen, you resurrection has to be more than just Easter. Resurrection has to be a part of your Christian life and your theology. When things happen and there's disturbance and crisis and problems and pain, somewhere you have to know the Savior who defeated death, hell in the grave, and rose on the third day, standing at the right hand of the Father, all things under His feet. You have to know Him more than just theology. You have to know that in your heart. My wife and I, You've heard me tell this story. I'm over the Pacific on my way home. Hell is shredding my mind. This, your daughter didn't die when you were in sin. You're out partying. You were crazy. You were preaching. 
you're pastoring. God doesn't love you, doesn't care about you. So appreciate our brother's testimony tonight. My son is with Jesus. And one day I'm going to see him. My wife and I have grown stronger. I remember God whispering to me, son, trust me, I know the end from the beginning. And I said, God, I trust you. I came home and Connie, I'm expecting, you know, I'm having a hard time. I think I called her from San Francisco for a few minutes, caught a plane. You've probably heard me preach this, but some of your most powerful testimony is when the world expects you to quit because of your pain. The world expects you to shake your fist and blame God because of your trouble. My dad, my mom got gloriously saved at our daughter's funeral. He'd been through World War II. He was a periodic alcoholic. He'd be sober, then he'd go on a binge a month, two months sometimes. Seagram's VO with Beer Chaser. He got saved. I said, Dad, what, what happened? You, wouldn't, you didn't want to listen to me. He said, I saw Connie. We rushed to your house when we heard Gail had died. We're expecting her to fall apart, and she's talking about the love of God. She's talking about Gail and God's grace of giving her a child, a daughter, you and her, for 15, almost 16 years. The joy of J. Rell, just a baby. And he said, she had to have something I didn't have, and it must be Jesus. Jesus said, I made dead things live. Devil may think he took you down, but God said, I am resurrection power. Do you know him tonight? Does he live in your heart? Is he demonstrated by your language and your words? Where you go, how you live, your behavior. More than just a story that's wonderful, yes. But he lives tonight. Pastor, he lives in me. In the good times, in the pain times. He is still the resurrected Savior. Amen. I ask you to bow your head with me this evening.